Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this contingency planning and emergency response for nonprofits in the middle of this coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, my name is Jim White. I'm the executive director of the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. Welcome. It's Thursday, April 16th, and we'll be doing this webinar from 12 to 1 today. So. Hopefully you will get a lot of great information from this and we uh, certainly appreciate your attendance and we're going to show you how to use the question and answer uh, boxes here in a moment. But let me first go through a couple of uh, uh, other issues here. Next slide. So we appreciate um, you attending this training webinar. Um, we invite you, if you're not a member of NAO, to become a member of NAO. Uh, we are your statewide association supporting all charitable benefit organizations across the state of Oregon. And right now, in, this, in the middle of this COVID crisis, we have made all of our programming free so that we can maximize the support to you and get out as much uh, information as in a timely way and uh, meeting the critical needs that you all have. Next slide. Today, we are lucky to be joined by uh, two panelists. Uh, Susan Romanski is the Senior Director of Humanitarian Capacity Building and Global Engagement at Mercy Corps. Uh, I won't say how many decades of experience Susan has, but um, she's got lots, and uh, I'm, I have worked with her in various parts of the world, and so I'm, I'm really happy to see Susan be able to make some of her time available to share the knowledge that she has today. Additionally, we have Steph Sharp, who is with the safety and prepared, she's the safety and preparedness manager um, in support of the COVID-19 incident command at CARE Oregon. So we really appreciate the time and expertise and knowledge that these two women are gonna be able to bring to us all today. Next. I, I wanna just do a quick thank you to our sponsors. We uh, deeply appreciate that the uh, organizations that you see on the screen now have uh, given us the ability to use their normal support, their sponsorship of our programs um, to be able to support these free webinars across the state. So we want to thank all of these sponsors and their support of this work as they're trying to help us get out information around the state. Next slide. We also want to thank these foundations who also have um, uh, uh, embraced the concept of allowing funds to be used whatever way is most important and necessary now in this time of need. They've allowed us to uh, also be able to bring these kinds of uh, informational sessions to you free of charge. Next. So today's agenda, I've done some introductions here. Um, the we're going to start with going through the phases of disaster response and lessons learned and how that information can help you in what we're dealing with right now. Um, we're then going to look at contingency planning and some case examples of how contingency planning can work even in the midst of an emergency. And then I'll be facilitating some Q&A uh, with all of you. What I would encourage you to do, I know some of you have been on these webinars before and you know how to use the Q&A functions, the chat boxes. Feel free to start um, populating that with any questions you might have. We are going to hold the questions, unless I see something really specific that is relevant to what's happening right then. We're going to hold the questions until we get to that Q&A session. Um, but we'll start first. Um, next slide. Oh, already said. Oh, so the Q&A box is, is, is on the right-hand side there, so you can um, uh, just click on that little uh, Q&A uh, box there, and that's where you can put your questions in to be posted for the uh, discussion. Um, so I'm going to invite Susan Romanski to kick us off here with uh, a discussion around the disaster cycle. Susan? Thank you, Jim. And I just want to say I was reminded the other day when um, Mercy Corps responded to the 2004 uh, Indian Ocean tsunami that back then we were talking about how this was truly a global emergency because we had citizens of 50 countries that were affected. When I think back on that now, you know, I can truly today say that this feels like 
the, the biggest global emergency in my, in my lifetime. And so it's with humility that um, I just want to share some, some learn, learnings that we've had through emergencies in the past. And to, and to frame that, um, I do want to talk about the disaster cycle. You, you see up on the screen, this is the typical FEMA disaster cycle. And I just want to explain these four phases a little bit. Um, normally, we start talking about mitigation. And mitigation is really minimizing the effects, right? Um, we, it's talking about building better building codes. It's talking about retaining walls. It's talking about land use planning. Some of this longer term work um, that usually takes place not during a uh, response phase, but either after, right, or just continuous. And then we have a preparedness phase. And these are, are real practical things like just contingency planning, looking at a potential uh, hazard or risk that may be coming and, and planning for that, exercising your plan, testing plan, plans, early warning systems. It's, it's things of these, this nature. Um, and then, of course, the response. The response is really about saving lives. It's about uh, providing essential functions to those in need, life-saving, food, water, basic necessities. And, and really, we're in the response now. Most of us think of something rapid onset like an earthquake or a hurricane, and this response phase really lasts only about one or two weeks where you are saving lives. But in the case that we're in right now, that's, that's not true. This, this is a lot longer. We know, for example, in Oregon that the Oregon Food Bank expects a peak of people needing food deliveries in May. So this is this is much longer, a much longer response where life-saving issues are, are at play. But the thing that I think is particularly interesting and that I wanted to focus a little bit on today is the recovery phase. Because traditionally the recovery phase phase, people think of it as infrastructure build up, shelter build up, these sort of um, very uh, construction-oriented things, right? Um, also, individual assistance from FEMA and public assistance from FEMA. But it, it tends to feel to most people as if it's quite short. You know, you have that one to two weeks or even one to two months response phase or relief phase, um, and then you've got recovery, and then you, you keep going. But we know from experience that the recovery phase can be so long. And when we think back to even Katrina, when you look at cities like Nashville and New Orleans and you compare when they were able to get their engines back up and running, the economic loss be between them um, was much, much higher in New Orleans because of the time it took to actually get that economy going. And, you know, I think it was Dr. Lucy Jones, a great scientist um, and, and uh, Cascadia risk specialist um, in Los Angeles said, you know, systems fail where they are already weak. And so recovery really is about trying to shorten that, that time that the economic engine gets back up. And the other thing is, you know, we, we are bombarded with uh, stats about you know, businesses, 40% of businesses fail after disasters, 75% will fail in, in the next year or two. But we really forget sometimes, I think, to look at the human aspects of it. You know, mental health, education, sort of this, you know, holistic look at recovery, not just the infrastructure and in addition to the economy. And so that's why people would still argue that we are still recovering after Katrina. That's why, um, you know, when the city delegation went to Japan a couple of years ago and saw communities that had been hard hit by the March 11th um, East Asia earthquake and tsunami, there, there were, they were still just so many people in temporary homes and, 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 and towns that just looked like they had never existed in the first place. So recovery is the long haul. And, um, and we want to focus a little bit on that today because there are things that we can be doing now that really can help us transition more quickly in the recovery phase. Um, I'd like you to go to the next slide because one of the interesting um, things about the disaster cycle is 
and I'm not so sure, can, can we move to the next slide? I'm still seeing the FEMA one, but I can talk through it. Yeah, there we are. Okay. This is, this is a disaster cycle from the Center for uh, Philanthropy. No, we could go back just one, sorry. Talked about two, two cycles. I'd love to have the one, yes. So what I like about this particular cycle is it uses still those four phases that FEMA does, right? The mitigation, the preparedness, the response and recovery. But it really highlights here that we are in that response reactive phase. And the reason why I think this is so important is because you is in your agency, you may not be feeling like, okay, well, my job is not about life saving, right? These are first responders that are doing those jobs. However, when you look at the rest of the disaster cycle, you'll see that the rest of it is not reactive, it's strategic. The things that we do right now can help all those other phases. We right now can be thinking through, you know, as, as we pause and reflect, what is it that we want our, our recovery to look at? What will happen um, if we start getting out of that recovery phase and we're getting into the mitigation phase? Are there things that we can be putting in place before the next disaster? And so I think, um, it's important to realize that the response is only one reactive part of, of the entire cycle, but it does give us an opportunity to be thinking about the rest of the strategic things um, that can help us be more resilient. So if we could go then to the slide just around a little bit about Mercy Corps' learning during this, this COVID crisis, I think that would be great. Um, would be the next one. We could go one more forward. Okay, thank you. So one thing I think is really important is just to get a little bit of context where you'll hear of emergency response and you'll hear about crisis management, right? And so emergency response is what first responders do. It is what Mercy Corps does overseas. We are providing life-saving assistance to those in need. Crisis management is really about anything that is affecting that core of your organization, the ability for the, the organization to keep on with essential functions. So it's different than I'm responding to an emergency, which is a hurricane, a particular hazard. It is literally about, do I have what I need to manage the crisis? You'll hear a lot, and if we, we could still go back to that slide, it would be great. Um, You'll hear a lot uh, around, in, especially in the domestic setting, around incident um, command, right, and incident management. This is where, for example, in my world at Mercy Corps, it might be that there's a, a hostage taking in a particular um, area. It could be a security incident of any kind. Here, it may be a fire, right? And so you have a structure that manages that incident. And for me, the crisis management is really about is that incident so big or is the issue so big that you, lots of parts of your agency are actually trying to work together to solve it? And so right now, what I would argue is probably all of our organizations, even if we're not an emergency response organization, we are certainly dealing with crisis management right now. And so I wanted to share a little bit about how we organize it, but, but agencies are, are gonna organize it um, differently in every case, right? Depending on, on the, the staff that they have. But basically, you want to make sure that the leadership is clear who is making the decisions, who is setting policy for leadership, right, for the agency. And then you want to make sure that you've actually got a functioning working group who are really looking at more of the tactical issues. So in our case, for example, we have a crisis management team, a group of decision makers um, who have to create policy um, very often uh, quick policies that affect you know, all of the 40 plus countries that we work in. But they really need the working group to be thinking through and getting information from stakeholders to make those policies. So if you're a small organization, it may be just one or two people that are decision makers, but you may have a working group of people that are feeding that up. 
you may just have one group, a senior management team that's, that's dealing with it all. But I think what is really important is just ensuring that the leaders of any organization are getting input from a broad stakeholder group of your agency. That is so critical. Um, so you see these, these kind of acronyms up here, crisis management team, senior management team, task force, you know, regardless of the name, I think it's just really important to have a clear structure of who's making the decisions and policies and who's helping feed into that and making sure that who's ever feeding into that is really getting uh, the pulse of, of staff when making the decisions. It may be, for example, that you have a stakeholder group and in that, uh, that, that working group, somebody is in charge of checking with peers to see how peers are doing through this crisis and any innovative ideas that come up. You may have someone in the working group who's looking at how have other agencies adapted and bringing those lessons in. You may have someone in the working group who's looking at staff care and, you know, morale for people working remotely. Um, and, and those people who have that information um, bring it up to the policymakers. So that's just, you know, one way that, that we've definitely been organizing. Through the COVID crisis, I would absolutely say that we've got three priorities, and those are listed up there. That is now number one, duty of care. Um, in our case, we had borders closing daily, hourly, you know, many expatriate staff stuck in particular countries. Um, you know, we had a staff member stuck in Dubai for two weeks. Um, so we really needed to make sure that we had people get to where they needed to go. But I think really relevant to everyone on this call is around if your organization, for whatever reason, can um, do some of its function uh, functions in, in the world right now, and you're not totally on lockdown or remote working, you're, you're working on essential functions, for example, you want to be sure that there is some kind of informed consent, that, that your staff really understand the risks um, of what they're doing. You know, for me, a perfect example, we had, you know, a comment from somebody in the, in the staff who said, well, Susan, you know, we work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We know Ebola, right? We have people that go out and risk their lives every day in this kind of very, you know, um, big uh, public health emergency. And that is true. But, you know, that person will go out into an unsafe space and come back to a safe space. With COVID, it's not necessarily that way. So as we have to make that really tough decision um, that there is no safe space right now, um, there are communities that are safer than others for sure, but we need to make sure that that staff person is okay with that. And, uh, and so I think it's really important that we're constantly checking in because that may change, right? A lot of people who do emergency response for a living know that they're risking their life going to northeast Syria. However, they never thought, well, gosh, I'm actually risking my life now, but now my family's life as I come back, right? Um, luckily, we have not had uh, those a lot of those incidents, but I think it's really important, just even from a domestic point of view, that we have informed consent and duty of care and things like mental health benefits that we can help folks, even with remote management, which can get very isolating, as I'm sure everybody on this call <laughs> has felt. Um, the next thing we're looking at is maintaining essential functions. How do we keep going when some of our programs have had to pivot? Maybe there's a particular country where there's government restrictions that are shut down. How do we keep going? And that is very relevant um, here in the domestic sphere, and Steph, Steph is going to talk a lot about that. Um, but then the third thing is pro program adaptation. How do you adapt programming when going out is, is risky? It's an issue. And so what we had to do is really look at minimum operating safety standards. That's the MOS, right? And this has to do with social distancing, minimizing crowds, right? Evaluating the risk every time we go out to see are there more border restrictions? Do we have PPE for staff? Do we need to disinfect vehicles? Hand washing. Um, it's we may all be talking about it every day, but are we actually writing it down and saying, 
you have to follow all these things if you are going out. And I think that is so important because times like this, um, we're, we're in Oregon, right? And we always like everybody's viewpoints and to participate and we really tend to include the whole community. But I will say that during disasters, sometimes a directive is actually, um, re it's a relief to people so they don't have to think about it. You know, do, do I really want to go out right now to do that food delivery if I don't have PPE? Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to have to make that uh, decision every single time you go out. You want your agency to be able to say, if you go to do that food delivery, here are the rules, here are the guidance that you need to follow. Um, in our case, if a program cannot meet those standards, we, they simply cannot carry out that program. So I think we do have to be, you know, clear um, that right now, even if the decision is not a popular one, we we need to give that guidance so that it, everybody doesn't have to be thinking about it themselves every day and making up something new. Um, so let's go to the next slide. I'd like to just um, talk a little bit about essential functions because I think Steph is going to get um, more uh, more into this. If we can go to the next slide. All right, well, I'll talk about it while the slides catch up with me. Um, what we had undertook an exercise to create a business continuity plan before COVID came out. Um, ironically, it was, you know, really more focused, uh, was all hazard business plan, um, business continuity plan. However, um, we really were looking at what we thought was the worst case scenario, which was the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And so, um, ironically, before COVID, I got to say, doing a business continuity plan wasn't really that popular with um, with our staff. Nobody really wanted to do it. It just seemed like a futile exercise, a waste of time, et cetera, et cetera. And boy, after COVID, you know, we became the most popular people um, with our business continuity plan. But what we realized, and I think this is important for everybody, is you know, we had 40 countries that had no business continuity plans, and so. How do we rectify that quickly? And I would say, you know, given the study that NAO did with PSU, there's a lot of organizations um, that just haven't really been able to make the time or effort to do a business continuity plan. So we did one um, very, very, very quickly. We came up with a template for all of our 40 offices. And Steph is going to go into more detail, but just to give you an idea of this. So for finance, right, we had to make sure that finance could be done remotely. And not just that, was there enough Internet connectivity to be able to make uh, to, to work on payroll? And, you know, even though we're here in Oregon, Internet connectivity right now in some places isn't that great. So it really is an issue. The other I issue around finance is do you have a backup? What if the person who does payroll or, you know, the two people who do, do payroll, what if somebody gets sick? Who's the backup? And I think in a lot of agencies, we just, we aren't used to that, that forward planning of just thinking of a backup for every single um, essential function. But the truth is, especially in this kind of context, we are going to have staff that, that, that may get sick. And so we really can't wait until they do to figure out who's going to be backing up because a lot of these things need some kind of delegation of authority, right? So bank signers, do you have more than a couple bank signers, for example? Um, when we did our, our plan for Cascadia, just as another example on uh, internet connectivity or the IT department, we realized that, hey, right now we're living in COVID. We, we, most of us, a lot of us have internet and we can still perform our, our, our jobs remotely. But in a Cascadia subduction earthquake, when there'll be so, so much damage, um, the internet is not expected to be up. And so what do you do in that case? So we had to make sure that everything is backed up, um, you know, outside of the West Coast. And, 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 and now we have a, a data server that's, that's outside the West Coast. Um, communications. Again, right now, internet is working, phones are working, but in a, in a different kind of risk, right, um, we might have to use ham radio as an example of communication. So these are not things that you want to be thinking of necessarily for a particular risk because you want to be thinking all risks. So in our next phase, as we go through recovery and mitigation and preparedness, 
it would be a great time to be thinking of those things, right? We all didn't expect this pandemic, so there's a lot of new things about this that we're, we're having to adapt to and adjust to. So, you know, as you have more time with business continuity, I would, I would really um, just share that it's important to think of all hazards. Um, so let me just finish from the next slide. slide, but I think um, I can go ahead and that. What I wanted to do is just share, you know, some some lessons that I feel like over emergencies we've really come to, and you know, that is that there's neuroscience. We have adrenaline that's pumping in the brain. I know that this has been several weeks going now, but I can tell you that we. In general, emergency managers will tell you we don't make the best decisions under stress and adrenaline. And so for me, it is really super important that we realize that and we use the brains around the table, um, which is another point down here. But you also have to think about how different we all react. We all cope very different. There are going to be people who spin it into high gear for your organization, and they're going to just you work a million hours. They're going to just you know, really want to want to shine during this time, and yet they may burn out really quickly. And as I was talking about with the recovery phase, it could be the long haul, right? So just really trying to pace staff that are 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 maybe going too too full steam ahead and 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 others who may not feel like they have the skills during this time giving them a bit of grace and remembering that recovery period that it's it's going to be a long haul um, the other thing is that we've learned uh, emergency managers we think because things are so important decisions are being made every day and they seem so incredibly important when we make them but because of adrenaline and because of the number of decisions we have to make, we tend to not write them down a lot of the times. And so um, I know in our programs, we have what we call an issues log. And it literally is just putting down, like, what decision did we make today and why did we make it? You know, even if it's bullet form, that is so critical because later as we come through this, we're going to look back and, you know, by then we're going to need a break. Someone's going to, you know, take over for a couple days and just be like, how did these people come up with the decisions? We make the best decisions um, we can at the time, but it's super important to document those. Um, I, I mentioned this already that during these times, it is maybe um, helpful to be a little bit more directive in your writing down policies, writing down uh, standard operating procedures, writing down minimum um, operating safety standards. However, we cannot feel as leaders that we need to be making these decisions ourselves. Use the brains around you. That is so critical. We're just going to make the best decisions when we've got input from other folks. So just try to focus focus them on a functional area or a particular area so that they can feed in to help you make decisions. And then around communications, I would say right now I feel like our country offices are just overwhelmed by the amount of communications that is coming out them from headquarters and really almost revolting, right? It is just really hard. Um, it's wonderful that we can give guidance, but the, receive, the folks on the receiving end sometimes can be overwhelmed by that. What I have never heard a complaint on ever is somebody saying, you're, you're, reach out, you're reaching out to me too much to ask me how I'm doing, right? And so I think it is so critical that we not assume what staff are feeling or how they're coping at any minute. We really, really need to be asking them and giving them grace and supporting them during this time. And then lastly, redundancy. Redundancy, as I mentioned, like we really need to have backups for things. We cannot assume we are invincible. I think as leaders, a lot of us, you know, I remember my uh, uh, elementary school principal recently, um, I, I have a son in elementary school, and I remember asking her um, like how we should plan if there was an earthquake um, without very many staff. And she said to me, oh, well, don't worry, I'm going to be here. And I had to say, well, what if you're injured? 
you know, I didn't, I didn't want to say, um, what if you, you die? But, you know, the truth of the matter is that we cannot think we're invincible. And so it is just so important that whatever is in that principal's brain, whatever is in that leader's brain, that you are sharing that, that you're doing cross training, that you're doing uh, redundancy. And as before I hand over to Steph, I would just say, um, you know, it is time that we may have to think of pivoting, right? We may have to use this time to think of how do we collaborate with others? Is there potential partnerships that we've never had before? Really look at that whole community to make sure that the gaps of uh, vulnerable groups that we know are more affected than, than the normal population. We know the from experience, years of experience, we know that it's, it's the elderly, it's minority groups, um, it's female-headed households that, that really suffer the most during emergencies. And so how do we make sure that our organizations are targeting those groups and, um, and including them in that vision and, and the re-pivot of our missions? Um, Jim, I think I'm going to stop right there and look forward to listening to Steph for a while. All right. Well, thanks, Susan. Really appreciate it. And as we uh, get questions rolling in, we'll be asking those of, uh, of, of you and Steph. But I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Steph Sharp. Steph? Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to build on some of the great things that Susan has mentioned. My video wasn't on before, but Susan, I was nodding the whole time you were talking. Um, we're so lucky to have you here in Oregon and so lucky for you to be sharing these great lessons with us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an Oregon-based organization and how we've pivoted in a time of crisis. There's three areas of focus that I want to make sure we touch on. One is building an incident management team. The second is continuity planning and the role that that plays. And then I also want to talk about a point that Susan brought up is how do we balance incident response with our the continuity of our day-to-day -day work. So I'm going to start by talking about incident management capability and how we build that function. So incident building the incident management capability starts with building a team. Um, so we can perfect. Once we build that build that team, those are the folks that really guide our incident response. So the types of individuals that can really be effective on an incident management team have strong organizational knowledge and oftentimes have a have familiarity with project management and planning. One of the key things an incident management team does is they try and shift from a reactive approach to response to a proactive approach. So there's a couple ways that the team does that by putting formal structures in place. They operate on what's called an incident planning cycle. So even if you're in the midst of a response, you're not running around putting fires out. That's part of the work. But you're setting objectives for a defined period of time. We call that an operational period. So for a pandemic response, Care Oregon is using a seven day operational period, meaning each week we develop a plan with concrete objectives that are specific, action oriented, realistic, and time boxed. Just you would for other elements of work. Um, and we say, okay, based on what we're seeing this week, these are going to be our objectives for next week. Um, and that starts to shift an organization from a, oh my goodness, the governor just issued this order. Now we have to figure out how do we do our work remotely and send staff home. It, it shifts the work from a reactive approach to a proactive approach where you're monitoring the situation, you're assessing um, your business critical functions, you're setting goals and objectives based on what you know to be true, and with the caveat that if there is a major change, like the governor's direction shifts and you do have to react, that the team is poised to and organized in a way that allows the group to react and adapt. So some of the key elements of an incident management team, operations, they're the ones doing the work, fixing the problems, for a lot of organizations, the day-to-day -day staff and the day-to-day -day management make up the operations section. The planning section can be a group that looks ahead. They're the ones developing the plan for the next operational period. They might also be developing a plan for, hey, when we can go back to work, what does that look like? What stakeholders need to be involved? 
logistics gets stuff. So if you're an entity, um, Care Oregon has a, um, a direct patient care arm under it. So we do have uh, a home health care business that's operating primary care. Gathering PPE at this juncture is a challenge for everyone in the nation. And so we have a team that's dedicated to sourcing protective equipment and collaborating with county emergency management so that anything that we can't, our, if our needs can't be met locally, it gets sourced through the county, which then goes up to the state um, to leverage statewide purchasing power uh, to try and get our healthcare providers the PPE they need. From a finance side, we're tracking all of the costs that we're incurring as part of this response. And that sets us up not only um, for potential reimbursement in the future, but even if there aren't opportunities for re reimbursement, um, having an accountability of what we're spending here allows us to both hit the, fill everything to the right budgets, keep and keep track of all of our, uh, our key costs. And then public information is handling all of the internal and external communications. All of this works because the team was delegated authority. In my role, day to day, I don't have a whole lot of authority. Uh, but the incident management team, in response to this event, was given responsibility for incident planning and response. Certain spending authorities oftentimes come with an incident management team. So a team may be given a delegation that says, you're allowed to spend up to $30,000 over the course of two weeks. Depending, and the amount would vary depending on the scope and scale of the incident. Other things that could be delegated would be monitoring the status of business critical functions, movement of personnel and resources to support those most those critical functions, and then also planning for return to new normal or in business continuity, we call that reconstitution. Getting back um, once, once your facility is operable again. So the third element that really makes a team successful is ongoing policy guidance. So while the incident management team is delegated responsibility, anything that they're not explicitly delegated within their scope of authority, they would then be touching base with a, with a policy group to get guidance on. So oftentimes there's certain decisions, you know, do you open, do you close? That may re be retained at the policy level. Strategies about prioritizing those critical functions, if that wasn't done as part of pre-planning, um, the incident management team may need guidance on how to, when you do start to see certain essential functions impacted in an event, the incident management team can then touch base with that policy group to see how that work should be prioritized. On the right side of the screen, you'll see that there's a, a list of planning process steps. This came straight out of the Federal Emergency Management Agency's operational planning manual. And just to the side of that, I tried to draw parallels with COVID-19 to say specifically in this event, you know, what, what types of resources are we using to understand the situation? How are we developing those goals objectives? Um, and then also what kind of a written plan are we producing? If someone wants to get really in depth with this, there's a lot of training that's available both locally um, and online. And at the end, I've got some resources that if organizations want to dig deeper into this, there's opportunities. So I'm going to move on to the next slide here just to show what some of the care organ objectives were for this particular incident and the type of work we're asking our teams to do. So we have three overarching priorities, and you'll see these align pretty closely with Mercy Corps. Um, we have the first priority is protection of life safety of staff and the membership that we serve. We're wanting to continue and enable prompt resumption of business operations and really make sure that we're protecting the business reputation. There's oftentimes that third objective, if you do have, um, if you're delegating authority to your incident management team for maintaining the, um, managing fiscal related risks, that would oftentimes be uh, where that would tie in as well, kind of into that third objective. So then a lot of the stuff our incident management team is doing are things you would expect. They're monitoring our business operations. They're connecting with county emergency management uh, to make sure that our response is aligned with the healthcare system's response as a whole. They're handling all messaging related to this event. They're sourcing protective equipment for our home healthcare agency. 
And then there's a lot of written products that we produce to keep the business informed. There's a great video that came out by the New York Office of Emergency Management several years ago that said, like, what is an emergency manager? And they basically had this video of little groups of people, like the, the general public would be in one frame, and then the firefighters would be in another frame, and the police officers in another frame. And the emergency manager in this video was just running around, understanding what was happening here and communicating it over here. And then understanding and communicating and making sure that the messages were aligned across all of the respective groups. So we produce a written plan that says, what are we going to do in the next week? We produce a written report that says, here's the situation as we understand it now within our organization. And then we also host a series of meetings. We're calling them operational coordination meetings, but we, we gather key stakeholders from around the business and allow a report out so that we can hear, everyone in the org can hear what the um, key actions are that each department is taking relative to this event. And all of those actions then roll up and are in alignment with the overall incident priorities. So I'll share an example of uh, what, what some of our written documentation looks like just to give, um, just to serve as food for thought. So we have some examples on the next slide that talk about our um, operational portal. So we created, just in time for this event, um, a place for our executive leaders to go, both to share information and receive information. Um, so this is one of the main work products of our incident management team. There's a place for staff to report, or for executive leaders to report if their staff have excess capacity. So certain staff members, like if they performed on-site security functions, and now that we move to a predominantly work from home environment, we're only staffing a single security staffer at a time. So there's a lot of unused capacity in that, uh, in that department. And so this can get reported in and then the incident management team could then deploy them to other areas, like perhaps our member enro enrollment team um, or our customer service call center could use extra support because we're expecting a, a boost in enrollment uh, given the current environment. So the incident management team is collecting that information and then redeploying staff back out to meet um, to meet our, our business needs. So there's both this portal, this place for folks to report information in, but then it's also a place where you can go and get information out. So we're monitoring how, what's, how many staff are absent for three or more days at a time by location. And that then gives executive leaders insight uh, as to anticipated absences so that they can then request additional support if they think their core functions are going to be impacted. Um, we're monitoring the status of redeployment. So we've had, uh, I think it, these numbers are a day or so old now, um, but we've had, we just recently deployed several full-time equivalents, over 20 staff, to support external requests outside of Care Oregon. Um, so we're both able to deploy internally and externally. And then we're also monitoring our critical function status. So the green bars in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, this screenshot was taken while we were collecting the data. Um, so the most recent week is only partially reported. But on an average week, we have, we have over 150 or close to 150 critical business functions. Around 90% of them are green, meaning they're functioning fully. And then the incident management team is able to focus on those sort of adverse events. So any, any functions that are in the yellow or red, we're able to monitor. Next slide. Jeff, the next slide has actually gone forward. You may not be able to see it yet, but um, I just want to remind you we're at, we got about 15 minutes left. I want to leave some time for Q&A. Perfect. So I can wrap up in the next five minutes if that works for you, Jim. Yep. So yep. On the business continuity planning side, there's a few elements that were really helpful. Um, for both Care Oregon and for other organizations to prepare. So we use a business impact analysis to lay the foundation 
for our all of our planning efforts. This identifies our core essential functions, downstream upstream dependencies, and all of the bits and pieces of technology, uh, equipment, personnel that rely on them. So while this is a great, I've outlined what are great best practices in, in a COVID-19 response, if this isn't work that's pre-laid out, some of the things that can be really essential for organizations is to focus on just those essential functions. Figuring out where those, where you have single points of failure and also ensuring that your succession plans are in place for key leadership positions. The delegations of authority that Susan talked about earlier really do go hand in hand with that succession planning and functions can be delegated both down and up. So sometimes you may have signatory authority, maybe delegated up or across in an organization, whereas management of certain functions may be delegated down. And so it can be really helpful to have both of those in place. Understanding what functions are location dependent is also really key for this incident. And I think now that most organizations are working from home, that's probably been figured out. But for us, figuring out down to the individual employee level what remote work capability was really key to our success. The other thing is, as organizations are thinking about business continuity planning in a time of response, oftentimes the tendency can be to really prepare for uh, the incident that's in front of us. But what I recommend to any organization taking on business continuity planning efforts right now is think about COVID, plan for that, but before the plan is finalized, zoom out and think, how would it be, how would things be different if this were a different hazard? And what that allows is an organization to develop a plan that will be long lasting and to be able to sustain beyond COVID-19. Next. So how do we balance this incident work along with our core mission essential work? So a lot of it is recognizing that the leaders within our organization are already great leaders and they already have a phenomenal amount of knowledge and expertise over their organizational area. So they really own and hold the responsibility for continuity of their essential functions. Where the incident management team comes in or this crisis management capability is really when an individual department doesn't have sufficient resources or capabilities to continue their function on their own. They may need help from other departments or decisions about allocations of scarce resources have to be made. So in this way, the incident management team is really keeping an eye on everything that's happening, understanding where the problems are, directing resources to support them that are aligned with organizational priorities and the criticality of those functions. So if there are 10 functions that are struggling, Three of those are really critical to the core mission of the organization. If you only have resources to support a few of those functions, you're really diverting them toward those three functions that are most closely tied to the organization's mission and success. There's usually when you start this process, there's a lot of things that get added in. So you may add in some planning or policy meetings to make sure that the work is kept on track and that you're thinking ahead into future operational periods, but you're also able to leverage many of the existing forums that exist that are already in place day to day. So if there are board meetings that are regularly scheduled or leadership team meetings, it can be a great place for the incident management team to tie in to report out on progress or status so that you're not bringing together, you're not creating more structure than is needed and the structure itself is aligned with the scope, scale, and impact of the event. So in closing, I have some resources that I'm I wanted to share with this group in case this is they want to dig a little bit further or there's someone in their organization that's going to be diving a little bit deeper into business continuity. So on the last slide, I don't need to go through any of these, but I've included some, um, some resources for other organizations to, to dive in a little further. And as far as how do you become successful and what are the key drivers, there's a lot of prior investment that goes into it, um, both in terms of time, planning, 
and expertise. But organizations, I think, can still take very concrete steps now to position themselves favorably in the future. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Steph. That was, uh, that was incredible. And we're going to leave that slide up there right now so folks can see that. Um, you'll see that in her slide, I think you can see that there are probably hyperlinks there. Is that right, Steph? Yeah. And so when we are completed today, we will be sending this out to everyone so that you can click through to some of these resources. But while we're waiting, I want to remind folks, you can um, click the Q&A button in the side there if you have a question. But I, I'm going to kick it off with a first question here for either one of you. Um, obviously, with, with Claire Oregon and with Mercy Corps, we're dealing with um, pretty large structured organizations. And a lot of nonprofits are much smaller than either of you. Is there a way to, um, to, to follow the, some of these essential practices for organizations that aren't going to have a lot of um, people you know, to rely on, a lot of resources to rely on? You bet. Susan, did you want to start? Well, I mean, you know, what, what to me comes to mind is just looking at partnerships. Um, so if a small organization is really collaborative with another one, you know, if, if things got really bad where that first organization doesn't have there's some way that um, there could be sharing. I mean, you know, I know that does have to happen. Um, and so I would say that that's really where like-minded agencies, you know, this is this is a good time for collaboration. The business continuity plans, by the way, that we did with our country offices, they literally were about 10 questions, you know? And so, um, but I do, do see that sometimes it's a struggle even to have a couple backups for those 10 questions, those 10 essential functions. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. And I think what we're going to need to do is uh, mute and unmute guys as we ask questions because I realize we're getting a lot of feedback. Um, I, I did want to ask, I'm going to, you know, Steph has already offered these great um, uh, resources here and we'll make sure that these get put as well on our resources um, list on our COVID site, on our website. But I did want to ask, um, Susan, you know, you mentioned uh, the basic MOS standards. Um, Mercy Corps using, you know, a 10 question uh, contingency plan for countries and also an issues log. Would you be able to share those as well? Or, you know, we could we could get those out to folks. Sure. Yeah, I think especially on the, the business continuity template, we're happy to share that. Um, the MOS. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder because a lot of those are the CDC, the CDC wouldn't be slightly better. And the reason why I say that is because in many countries where we work, there isn't a requirement for masks, for example, because that's WHO. And so there's, you know, a lot of, particularly around masks, there's a lot of change with, with countries. So that may not be on there, but certainly the issues log and the reporting template, I think would be great. I'm happy to share those. That's fantastic. Thank you. And um, yeah, what we'll do is um, we'll we'll pull down the CDC boss and and uh, staff. Maybe you know of if, if there's an Oregon specific um, suggested boss. You know, I I tried to look through what I thought were some of the the, the most pertinent resources when I put this together. A lot of organizations do rely on. Uh, the, the federal government resources, they're a little more in depth, but one of the reasons they're such great resources is they're all free and they're all available. So I haven't seen anything from Oregon State, from Oregon specifically, um, that offers quite as much as these federal resources. That's great. Okay, then we'll we'll make sure that we get those and, and get those out to everybody. Um, uh, additionally, I wanted to um, just, again, go back on that single point of failure issue. I just want to make sure people understood that. So could either of you explain again, what is the what is a single point of failure and what, what, what do you mean when you're saying make sure that you have a backup? Susan, 
So with the, when Care Oregon looked at single points of failure, we looked at personnel, uh, equipment, and business processes anywhere that we had reliance on a single piece of technology, a single data connection, a single individual with knowledge, skills, and ability to complete a function, and looked at redundancy. So for our data center, this meant having multiple data feeds into our, into our building. It also meant we, we moved our, our data center from our downtown office building out into a more resilient uh, infrastructure hub out in Hillsboro. But from the personnel standpoint, a lot of times it means we figured out that we only have one person who can complete payroll in full. And so getting some redundancy there or our check printer is located in the downtown office. Uh, and if we close the facility, then we don't have the ability to print checks. So making sure that we have the ability to complete those functions uh, and we have a backup in case one of them isn't available. That's great. Thanks for thanks for giving that clarity, Steph. That's really useful. Um, one other issue while we're waiting, hopefully some, some I think you've stunned people into silence, by the way. Um, folks are, are, I know there was a lot of information. You both went through this. You both have a lot of competency in this work, so it just rolls off your tongues. Um, and, and, and perhaps people need to kind of dive through your, your um, the information you provided. So, um, just as we're waiting, and again, I want to remind folks for, for Q&A, if you just um, go down in the, in the side there and ask your questions, I can ask them of, of Steph and Susan. Um, so we do have one question here. In what ways does the work of a nonprofit's board of directors need to change in response to a crisis like COVID? As staff leaders, what information and guidance should we be providing to our boards during this time? And what kinds of help should we be seeking from these volunteer leaders? I feel that um, right now is, is is such an important time, even just on morale. I mean, there's one thing about helping with any kind of you know decision, hard decisions that have to be made, especially around agencies who might be having a bit of an existential crisis on how to pivot. Obviously, the you know the board should be involved in that. But I can say just you know from personal experience, our board got together and just did a big you know video for staff saying how much they were behind them, et cetera. And, and even that small gesture was felt hugely through the world. Um, it was so, so important. But, you know, on, on the, other, the other side of it, I mean, we have to figure out what is it that we're laddering up um, that's important enough for, for a board to be paying attention to. And it really is about, you know, how, how much of what we do now can be adapted, how much can be pivoted, and getting their input on that, because it really may be that our mission, we're gonna to have to reevaluate that completely. And when I say we, I mean the broader, you know, nonprofit community. Um, we may have to, to, to pivot in a way that maybe wasn't imaginable before. And, uh, and we're gonna need all the reflection and sort of brains around that process as possible. And I think that very much involves the board. That, that's really helpful, Susan. And I, I would just add on to that is that just before this was, you know, as, as we were making decisions around um, what we were going to be doing in suspending our programs, our in-person programs at first, and then suspending our office work, um, I, I certainly made sure that our board was, a, was aware of what we were doing, um, had their support. I pulled out to, to Steph's one of Steph's earlier points. I pulled out our delegation of authorities matrix to me. Um, in in the in the one that I have currently have is I can't take out loans. Well, the paycheck protection program is technically a loan, so I had to have them make sure that they gave me explicit uh, and and that was recorded that there was a board. Uh, approval for us to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program, even though we plan on getting that um, that forgiven um, and it turning into a grant. So just getting those details, the good news is, is that um, because of some work that um, a, a lot of groups did earlier about um, uh, making sure that boards can meet electronically over um, the internet, we're actually well suited in Oregon to be able to take votes of boards through uh, Zoom and, and other facilities, which before would have required 100% um, 
uh, quorum now. You can just use a regular quorum. Uh, one other quick question here. I know we're right at one, but I want to try and get these questions if we can. We have five of 35 uh, staff members, um, you know, breaking down. They're crying on Zoom at staff meetings uh, because they're, they're so anxious and depressed. And how, how can we help these folks from afar? What's your advice? Susan, it looks like you're on mute. No. Yeah, somebody, there you go. Great. Somebody said to me yesterday, oh, yeah, you know, we're working from home, and it's so frustrating, et cetera, et cetera. But I saw a quote that basically said, no, you're not working from home. You are at home in a crisis and working. And so I think that distinction is so important because we absolutely have to have grace around the fact that this is really hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. And I would say, you know, it's not just hard with people who have families. It's hard for people who are by themselves, right? And so um, I think we are going to have to over-communicate on the empathy and the team building, even if it's in a remote way, because um, this, you know, unfortunately, it is going to be the long haul. And so I think we have to find ways to connect. And sometimes that's humor. Sometimes, you know, um, it's, it's just sending, sending people love in, in, whatever, in whatever way. But I think it's, it's so important, especially as leaders, to be acknowledging um, what people are going through and not trying to make up because a lot of people feel, well, gosh, I feel less productive because I'm not going to the office, not trying to make up for lost productivity by longer hours, because guess what? The longer hours, that's not going to help anybody. We really, really need to have, you know, that that brain, that headspace to be able to be reflective for this next long haul. Well, thank you again. I, I want to be conscious of both of your time. You're both very busy and doing important work and conscious of the time of the attendees that we have. Um, one thing I did want to mention is that um, what, one way that I think our, our nonprofit community can help our staff, our volunteers, um, we're actually going to be doing a session this time next week with Financial Beginnings to help nonprofit employees, some of who have been laid off, um, to help subcontractors you may be engaged with. A lot of folks use 1099, you know, bookkeepers and folks like that to help them with their financial um, planning. So this is a, a special um, uh, program that we've come together with Financial Beginnings to offer to anyone for their staff board, for their uh, clients that would help them kind of think through the financial stresses that a lot of us are feeling right now as we're uh, working through this. I want to again thank uh, Steph and Susan for sharing their amazing uh, knowledge, their, their, uh, their experience. Uh, appreciate what they're doing both here in Oregon and around the world and um, appreciate all of you for joining us today. So with that, we're going to close this session. We will send these out to you in our, um, our evaluation and our follow-up and we will also post these slides and the resources on our COVID-19 webpage. Thanks again.